All right. Okay, Professor, I'm gonna do it like this. Um, you will see on that is written, everyone has a story to tell. But that we actually try to concentrate more on the individual more than the what you do. That one is also important because we're gonna spend a lot of time there just now. But we also like to concentrate on you. So tell me, where were you born? Uh, tell me a little thing about you growing up as a little girl. That's a long time. I might shall remember everything. But um, okay, when was I born? I was born in 1967. The same year that the Civil War started. I'm older than the Civil War by three months. And I was born in um, Abba, Abia State. So my earliest experience was of the war. I don't remember much of the war, actually, I don't. But I remember after the war, 1970. That's my earliest memories, 1970. Hello and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi Ewan Fort, and I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. Well, my parents were back from wherever they were during the war. We were Tenogo. I remember that. I remember the street being so deserted. There were just few people in our street. I mean, the world kind of was strange to me in those days. There were not many people. It was like just few people that got created with my little mind. That was the way I figured it out. And, uh, but over the months, people started coming back, you know, and we started having um, friends, neighbors, and it was time to go to school. And, um, I started school. So that's about my little girl days. <laughs> that, that's really interesting. That is really interesting. Uh, now, uh, looking at your curriculum, you have a lot and lot of achievement of, 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 of work, especially in the academic world. Um, now, before we get there, I'm trying to understand, and I'm not going to trace so much on the Nigeria Civil War experience, even though we have a lot of things to discuss on that later on, but since we are still in the early age of your evolution now, of you growing up as a, as a little girl, I'm trying to understand what influenced you. History is very important. It's, it's what tells us where we are coming from. But if we don't know where we are coming from now, we don't even know where we are going, and that means we are confused with where we are right now. So I'm trying to understand what influenced you into making the decision that you want to make your contribution within the area of history. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you for this question, really. It's part of my little girl days. You see, I was so curious about life. I remember in those days, I'll be asking my mother, what happened before this time? What happened before that time? Um, sometimes she'll get exasperated and tell me to please give her a break. I wanted to know. I wanted to know from who created God. I wanted to know how did it all begin. I wanted to know how did I get to where I was. And uh, she couldn't furnish all the answers, you know. I would say in those days I was closer to my mom. She was around. Like my father was a medical doctor, so he was always away. You know, we get to see him in the evenings when he's back from work, and uh, he didn't have all that too much time to spend with us. But my mother, she was a teacher, she had more time, she was available, so she took the barrage of all my questions, she couldn't answer all of them. In my second, in my primary school, around primary three, primary four, I heard about this subject history, that they told stories of the past. That was my first fascination. So I looked forward to studying history. Sadly, when it was my turn to be in primary five, the year that I should have started history, history was no more in the curriculum. So you can see that I was somehow cheated out of um, learning history early enough, but my curiosity persisted. My father may have contributed to it because 
she, he was always buying books for us. And I had a lot of them, exciting stories, stories about uh, the French Revolution and things like that. I, wrote those, I read those stories as a child. They fascinated me the more. I wanted to know the past. I was intrigued about the lives of people, generations before mine. I wanted to know how life was like. So all this cumulatively informed my going to study history. It was in secondary school now, I had the opportunity of um, taking classes in history and um, I loved it. And I didn't want to stop, that's it. Thank you, thank you so much for that. And now I would like to spend some few seconds there again. And because uh, if there was a question I prepared for you because being an expert in history, I was going to ask your reaction uh, to the 10 years suspension of history in the Nigeria curriculum, which of course was brought back now during the administration of Buhari. Yeah. So if I, you even bring it even forward now in that in your days, it was also not in the curriculum. Yeah. Now, I'm even more curious. Tell me more about those periods when history was not in curriculum. I'm trying to understand actually what is the reason, what is the justification? Why was history have to be removed from curriculum in your time? It will come also to the current time. Yeah, you see, I had no way of knowing that there was an official policy. I was too young. That was my primary school. And my world was not that broad. I don't think beyond the little uh, uh, programs, you know, on TV for children, somebody like me bothered with a national news. The way I was brought up, we were made to go to bed by seven o'clock. So that kind of cut me off from the news period. News in those days was 9 p.m. I should have gone to bed two hours earlier. So I had no idea that there was an official policy to remove history. I only know that it was when it was my turn in primary school to be taught history, there was no history. You know, that's just all I knew. But in second, no, not even in secondary school, it was in the university, I became aware of uh, the politics of um, removing history from the curriculum. When we were admitted to, to history, that was um, 1985. By 1986, 1987, we heard through our lecturers about this uh, national policy against history. You know, So we were very few in class, I remember. In my department, we were very few. My own class, we were about like um, 11 students who came to study history. We were made up by people from education and uh, mass communication that like borrowing the course and so on. But for those of us that came to study history, we were just 11. And the year before me, they were equally, I think they were nine or even less than nine. So we got, we became aware through our lecturers that um, there was a policy against history the government wanted to promote the science subjects. So the humanities had to be stepped down. And one of the causes that was out of favor was history. It didn't affect me personally. It didn't bother me. I continued reading history. And I remember telling my colleagues in those days that if I will come back again, let's say I will die and go, we recreate the world and I'll come back, I will still study history. So that was just how it was for me, and, you know, in life. It helps you to know where you're heading to. It helps you to understand where you are at any point in time. Besides the lessons you can pick from history, there are so many lessons. We make mistakes because we don't learn from history. It's true. If we can spend a little time to study what people did in the past, to understand their mistakes, and to understand the opportunities and how to navigate around them, we can do better in our own time than they did in their own time because we'll be standing on their shoulders, actually learning from their mistakes to improve on our own circumstances. And now, uh, coming back to the same episode, uh, which happened 
the recent time, the removal of this tree from curricular office was restored again 10 years during the administration of, um, of Buhari. What can you tell us about the rationale also for this period? Because this is the second time that it's happening now. The, the fact is, it was one removal we had. It was not removed twice. It was just one removal that took uh, stages, you know. In the 70s, it went off from the primary school curriculum. Sometime in the, in the 80s, it also went off from the secondary school curriculum. From junior secondary, first of all, from junior secondary, it was only re uh, left for the seniors. All this while, they were forced to bring it back. Because of the removal, people turned away naturally from that subject. So we're not really having people that will study history in secondary school, senior secondary school. History is a vast subject. So when you take it off from the lower levels, there's a kind of burden at the senior level. To manage that burden, people will not have to choose, or lecturers, teachers will have to choose what they can teach and what they cannot teach. Most of the students do not have the background at the lower level to help them with the subject. Eventually, we were not having even teachers to teach history in secondary schools at the senior level. I recall that um, during my youth service, I had to teach in a secondary school. And um, after my youth service, actually, after my youth service, I had to teach in a secondary school and there were no students. What I was now assigned to teach was government. More people we are doing government than history. And government is not history. Government is just a little aspect. It focuses on just how to rule, the way of ruling. But history deals with the totality of man's life. All that men have done in the past come as history. It deals with governments, it deals with the economy, it deals with development, it deals with um, manufacturing, it deals with everything possibly. So that problem made it difficult for the subject to continue. I mean, it could not, it, 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 it could not resuscitate itself because so much harm has been done to it by the remover not taught in the primary school, not taught in the junior secondary school, just uh, restricted to two years or three years of um, senior secondary school was not enough to groom teachers. We are still having that problem till today. Coming to the restoration, it was not actually Buhari, President Buhari that brought back history. It started with President Obasanjo, but to integrate it was a problem. The approval to restore it was given by President Obasanjo. The approval to begin the negotiations and the processes of restoring it came under President Goodluck, Jonathan. Now, uh, putting all these things in practice came under President Muhammad Buhari. So it's been a long process of trying to restore it back to the curriculum. The good thing now is that we have it back in the curriculum from the primary level to the university level. But my head is almost like boiling up. In that I don't understand how we managed to do this harm to ourselves, no? <laughs> how can we produce children not to know about themselves? Because here in this podcast, I've talked with a lot of people, professors, uh, and, uh, lecturers also in the United States, for example, who are, who are teaching, who are teaching history, sometimes teaching maybe other subjects, or just writers, or just ordinary people. In most of the cases, we have had to argue about the topic of, or actually, the idea of why African history is not taught in the United States. That is, in the United States, we want African history to be taught there. 
But we are talking of Nigeria, a country that is governed, that supposedly governs themselves. How could they manage to remove history as something that is being taught to the children? Okay, now, when you were much younger, you were in primary school, you didn't have the chance to study history, you didn't understand it then, but yet you went ahead and continued it. You didn't understand the rationale of the government to do that. Now, as an expert, a senior researcher, writer in this field, I want you to explain to us what really is the justification? Why is it that Nigerian people shouldn't know about their history? Who understand the justification? It has no justification. It has no justification at all. Um, over the centuries, so many societies have fought their own history for one reason or the other. There's what we call rewriting of history. Society sometimes can go through the process of rewriting their history. They choose what they want to expose of their history and they suppress others. It doesn't make for a healthy um, national life, actually. It doesn't. Now, coming to Nigeria, we are a very multi-ethnic society. Some say that we are more than 400 ethnic groups. I will not say no, especially after a friend of mine from Adamawa State gave me a list of the ethnic groups in that state alone that are well over 90. If one single state has more than 90 ethnic groups, imagine what 36 other states can boast of. So we, what we've only succeeded in doing is to hide our history from ourselves and to cause more confusion in our national life. The understanding we need to live together, we took it away from ourselves, you know. So many things are wrong. I will not say that there's any justification. There's simply no justification for this. There is none. If they say that they want us to, to, to become technologically savvy, what advancements have we done even in that direction? Since they removed um, history and uh, from the curriculum, what have we done? We still have not um, improved technologically or scientifically. We cannot claim to have made any significant headway in those areas. So it is not a justification for removing history. We needed our history to build our national life, that sense of belonging, that cohesion, you know, that oneness, to understand our diversity. Diversity should be strength. Diversity is not a weakness, it should be strength. I should be able to say that this is my own strength and that is your own strength. The Igbo are good in this, the Yoruba are good in that. Let us strengthen each other's capacities. But by taking away our history, we don't even know our capacities. We now started um, um, guessing, second guessing ourselves. You know, making assumptions that are not factual about ourselves and the expense. We are all suffering it because as a nation, you can see that our level of cohesion is very weak, is very poor. There is no cohesion. We look at each other as enemies because we've not bothered to study and understand ourselves. Something as sensitive as our, as our history is something we should have exposed our children to. They should start early to know themselves. Today, when we, when we send people for youth service, they continue to say, I will not go there, I will not go there. Why? Because they never had the privilege of knowing what that other group is like, how they live their lives, what is type and not capable in those places. And we've had a lot of um, tragedies as a result of I will not go and I will not go because we don't know our history. I don't see any justification in that policy, personally, I don't. I, it was more sinister than anything good. It didn't help us at all, it didn't.
And before we can correct the damage, it will take time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is what we always do. We destroy ourselves and we take generation after generation to, to fix it. All right. Now, going back to our history again, going back to our, because um, as a people, we did not start in 1960. We've been living for thousands of years. I always yeah. say this. <laughs> now, the Bini built the war that is reverent in the whole of human history. Do you know that I am from the state where that war is? And I was not told. I didn't know anything about it until I have left Nigeria. That was when I heard for the first time that there was something called the Benin War. How could they do that to me? That is supposed to be my heritage. <laughs> okay. okay, now, in our tradition, in various African tradition, we don't play with history. How do I know this? Let's go back to our tradition. We usually have storytellers, people who tell their history, who, who say this is the war we have fought with our neighboring community. This community, you don't go there, they are our enemy because they have done this and done that and done that. That is history. They will tell you, in this other neighboring village or in this other kingdom, we have been friends because we have done this and done that and done that. This is history. Okay, in most of the cases, if we speak from village setting, our history is not also left untold. Our history has always been told. Why is it now that in a Republican style, where we have administration over this entity, of a place, of a people, that aspect of it had to be removed. Why was it not contested that we have always known about our past? Because now, currently speaking, we need to ask the Europeans what has been our history. I read, actually, from what has been documented from Europea about Benin War. This is my history, which I have to learn from other people. Where are the Bini people that should tell me our history from the point of view of advantage because they are telling their history? Why were this confusion so, I don't know, become so accepted that it is, it is right not to tell our side of the story? It was not accepted. I will not say it was. But remember when this thing happened? You know, um, 1975, 76, 77, when, when I was in secondary school, the national leader was a military head of state. And Nigeria was unfortunate to have had this long range of military leadership. The military have their own style of doing things. The military don't ask you what you think about what they want to do. They come with a decree, and once they issue the decree, everybody has to obey. When you don't obey, the threat of the Kirikiri maximum prison <laughs> is there to silence those who may be very vocal. So I will not say it was accepted, it was not accepted. I am very much aware that people kept writing against the But who was? I recall in those days too, as an undergraduate, how impoverished the school system was. I recall that. Funding for education in Nigeria has always been very low, very appalling, very shameful. Even some other nations in the continent do better than we do. These are all the issues that affected this um, policy. It is instructive that it was the very moment we got back to a democratic leadership that approval was given to restore history. That is very, very instructive. So for all the years, there was no history. 
the military was in government and the military decided what they thought was good for the country, even when they were seeing that it was not good, they insisted on it. So it is really sad that um, we, we are stifled to the degree we were. Our historians left the country. I know my teachers that left uh, during my undergraduate days, they left the country, they went to the West and they became renowned historians over there discussing other issues. They went elsewhere and they championed the histories of other places, not our own. Until our leadership now decided to bring back history, we are trying now to raise a core of historians who will now pick up the challenge of writing their history. That, that is a really big challenge because if you look at other countries, look at even a small country like Italy, look at Germany, look at France, look at the United States. This guy spent billions, billions of dollars in the construction of history. Because like you were said, like you were saying before, history is not just neutral things. These are highly a uh, highly strategic tool for you to be able to survive in this world. It's not neutral. As a country like Nigeria, they need to decide what is going to be Nigeria in the world. When you measure Nigeria, what does it represent? And this will pass through your education. Because you need to configure it in the head of the people. Why, they need, why do they need to defend this country? Why? Why, do, why should the American government spend a lot of money in Hollywood? Why? How much is the Nigerian government spending on Hollywood to make sure that the Nigerian story is told? Because we think it will just happen. It will not just happen. Or yeah. maybe we have to pray to God. It's not going to happen. Forget it. If you want it something happen. to happen, you will do it. The Nigerian government must spend money for the type of story they want to be told. All right, now, what do you think is the right strategy? Because now we are too late, too late to the, to the conversation of history. Do you know that I have to read from outside of a no culture in central Nigeria, dating back to at least 3,000 years? It is shameful that I have to read it from outside. The Italian, I live in a small city of less than 3,000, 300,000 people. Here in Verona, where I live, where of course Shakespeare wrote, uh, wrote about his story, uh, Romeo and Juliet, wrote the only the story of Romeo and Juliet contribute a lot to the survival of the people where I live. In terms of tourism, they build a lot of things in this fictional story. Hotels are named after Romeo and Juliet. This didn't just happen. They did it, they constructed it because story is a fabrication in some cases. It is not just, it is, okay, facts are yes, but according to who? Story, I think there are two words there that I usually say is his, second one is story, meaning it's a point of view. Whose point of view is, is the narration that we are telling? What do you think is the right strategy to really restore the Nigerian story? We are on track, we have to start from somewhere. Um, I must commend what the government is doing now. And um, I must commend especially UBEC, Universal Basic Education Commission. They're actually championing this introduction of um, history. Um, I was fortunate to be in the team that looked at um, how to bring back history, what we can do. We agree that we have to start from the lower level, from the primary school. And at that primary school, we are looking at those things that tie us together. We start from the things that connect us and we move to our specific stories. We need to understand what is Nigeria. We need to understand what is uniform in Nigeria. We need to understand what makes us us. So we start from that central axis, those things that connect us. 
that are uniform across board. We start from there. We have heroes, we have heroines in all our societies. We live together. We believe in mutual coexistence. We relate with our neighbors. We have neighbors. These neighbors are friends. We agree, we disagree. We do not disagree permanently. There's always a give and take. While we are forging our unity at this level, we are also conscious of our specific stories that within that big Nigerian space, we have smaller spaces. One space for the Hausa, one for the Ijo, one for the Jukun, one for the Tib, and so on and so forth. They have their specific stories. They have their uniqueness. So we start also to introduce at our respective levels, this uniqueness. That means that the person studying history from Tivland should be very familiar with the history of Tivland as much as he or she is familiar with the history of Nigeria. So you don't study the history of Nigeria at the expense of the history of Tivland. If you are from Jukun, you should be able to know your history as much as you know the history of Nigeria. You should be able to function in Nigeria as a Nigerian. You should also be able to function in your community as a Jukun. You should know your friends. And you should know those things that connect you with your neighbors. We've not always been fighting. We have been friends. We have been borrowing from each other. Sometimes we pull our strengths together to fight a common enemy, you know, depending on what we call a common enemy and so on and so forth. So that is what we are doing. And I believe that this is the right strategy because we've lost a lot of ground. We've lost a lot of ground. We are trying actually to cover up. To start now is early enough. Imagine if we leave it off another 10 years, it's going to be catastrophic. We just have to start now to understand Nigeria and understand our disparate communities and carry the two together. The question of hero, I think it's also very important in terms of our national identity. In that, okay, when we speak about the Nigerian Civil War just now, by the time we're looking at um, your book, now, I always say that when we are looking at our hero, we should be able to identify the people that have died in the Nigerian Civil War because they have died in a war in this country. So these people are not just the Nigerian uh, side or the Biafran side. All of them, as we currently state, as we currently stand at Nigeria. So they are the Nigerian heroes, talking of the current, uh, the, the contemporary history. But we can even go further than that. The Kijaja of Popobo, many other people who have managed to esteem what we should call pride, no, in the people, something that you should be proud of. All the people in the country that have managed to do this, talking about people about contemporary history, they should be our hero. Now, looking at looking at the North culture, for example, the Central Nigeria. Now, we should be able to take this, what these people have done, and improve on them. Because currently, as a currently stand, in Akeda, we don't have anything. But it is not true. But the question actually I'm asking here, locally about how we can rest restore the history, is about documentation. How do we go about documenting part of this history? Like looking at a certain section of the of the country who have had okay, now let me go back again. In the city where I now live in Verona, if you were to build anything at all. And the city council know that other way you are building, that is the remain of the Romans, they will not allow that, that project to go on. They will go and dig it up and return that story properly. In fact, this city where I live benefits a lot of money for people just coming to find out about the Romans. That is their history. Now, how many people are spending money to go and visit the, the Benin War, for example? In fact, the Benin people are destroying this war to build something for themselves, just destroying it. But people go to visit the walls of China. 
So how do we document it and monetize it? Because this is our product. How do we document it so that we can then monetize it? How do we go about that also? It's still part of um, official policy. For instance, we have we have um, an office for museum and their monuments. They should be responsible for all our legacies, how historical legacies, they should be. What you are saying now is kind of um, pointing a finger at their effectiveness. We, I don't know really, but um, I believe that this falls squarely under their jurisdiction. Since the, since the ministry is there, or the office is there, they're the ones to mark out those things that are landmarks that should be protected, that should not be destroyed, and come up with modalities of use. I know that um, in Enugu, they have uh, this very powerful um, office so close to, to the former zoo. Um, how they're protecting our legacies, I cannot say. I cannot say. If our legacies are falling into disrepute, I cannot really say. I know that um, the war museum in Oma here is not, it's not faring any better. What it tells me is, um, a kind of a policy of silencing. Yeah, of silencing, choosing what should be preserved of our past and what should not be, no. The United States, you talked about fought a war. The fact that one section of the country fought against the other section did not mean that they obliterated everything from the section that fought against the others. They have tried also to keep monuments of that past. So for us in Nigeria, across Nigeria, whether at NOC, even the tin mines or the Bini walls and so many other legacies that we have, these things should be protected. These things should be preserved. These things should be intentionally documented. It's not only with our monuments that there are problems. Talk of the archives too. The archives should be the place where these documents should be stored. If you go to our archives, our records are in disarray. Most records are lost. If you see where materials, ancient materials are stored, you'll, be, you'll feel sorry for Nigeria. And we have people that are paid to take care of these things. I don't know how, um, how carefully they are supervised, I don't know. But I know that we have records of the Bini walls that even visitors to Nigeria helped us to document. These are not really being taken care of. So we have the problem with the monuments themselves. We have the problems with the archives where the documentation about these things should be stored. I don't know. <laughs> It says a lot about um, Nigeria and um, our sense of what is right or our sense of what is valuable, not what is right, what is valuable and what is not valuable. Well, I just said that yesterday, an English uh, person wrote a story about a city called Verona. Mm. And now this city is making a lot of money from that one story. Now, in Nigeria, we tend to believe that we are poor, but we are not poor. We are paid with money, but we lack the packaging. Whether you are looking at the story of Romeo and Juliet here in Verona, where I live, or the ancient war of Benin, you don't need to recreate it. It's already there. The question is developing a strategy to market it. Because by marketing it, you make the state, and those states will make money from it. Because a lot of people will be coming to visit to know about the Benin War. Now, books will be written by the, about the Benin War. Those authors will make more money. Because if you are making more money doing this, are you going to be complaining anymore? So I don't really know where we have this problem. 
where all this monument but uh, do you know how many how much the british museum make that people just visited them of course now many of us in diaspora we are crying we are crying how they should return the artifact that they have stolen from africa bring it back to africa yes it is right we need to do that but the question i've also asked some other agitators is when they get when they give you this because Gemma have already promised to return most of this material back to africa when they return them do you have the instrument to be able to protect them? What are you going to do with them? Thing is, the British didn't steal everything from Africa. The ones that were left behind, what are we doing with them? Because we cannot just be there only to shout and to accuse other people. We, us, us, what are we doing with the resources that we have? Are we waiting for the Chinese? to tell the story of the Benin War, where there are a lot of Benin people, <laughs> intelligent people, professors, writers. The problem is our value system. Is our value system. What do we value? What is important to us? You know, our value system has changed so drastically since um, the last um, two, three decades, I would say. Since the 1980s, our value system has changed so drastically. Um, we don't want to labor. We want people to come and do our work for us. Everybody wants uh, to be rich overnight. Nobody really wants to work. But these things, like you said, that things that will make that should make us really very rich. They should, and we don't need to to embellish them to tell the story. We don't, but we need regulations. For instance, don't pull down the Bini walls again. I know that in Berlin, they brought down the Berlin wall, but they didn't bring down all of the wall. They left some sections so that tourists, visitors can still see the remains of the wall. We can legislate, we need to, we need our policy makers to actually make policies that are useful to us. Policies that are enduring, policies that can add value to our lives. So all these things are important. They are there, they are there. Instead of um, those of them trying to run outside Nigeria to look for greener pastures out there. There are enough things to engage them in the country to keep them busy. The thing one may talk about is funding. We are not so excellent in philanthropy. I see our philanthropists as a people that have an eye on politics political philanthropy, that is what goes on in the country. If you can uh, invest into politics so that when your candidate comes in, sure of getting dents out of that, that is one area where we differ significantly from some other nations that have values for their culture, values for their past. You know, they bring out money to preserve these things. They encourage themselves to set up these monuments, to set up these um, tourist um, issues, stuff, zones, and they finance it. As these things yield, they make something out of it. Something just came to my mind now, and that's um, former governor of um, Cross River State, Donald Duke. Donald Duke did a lot in Cross River State to help that state harness their culture, harness their, their legacies, you know, he started a slave history museum, started quite a lot of um, tourist areas where they put together their cultural artifacts and then um, tourists will go and watch these things, commission people who told the story. Somebody has to take charge of these things, somebody. That somebody can be me actually, but I must confess it is not my, in my area of uh, interest at the moment. 
So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a head of state or a governor, but somebody has to, has to take it seriously that this is important. Somebody that has the interest should take it seriously that this is important and work towards it. Yeah, yeah, it is true. It is us, no? It's only that sometimes some of these things to do them, we, we need uh, not just finance, not only finance, but we also need legislation able to, to make them work. Yeah, that's correct. Now, talking of your area, which area do you really concentrate on mainly in your, in your history? It's difficult to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's very very difficult to say i will um i think what yes i started out as a, a gender scholar women's history but i have since moved away not completely i look at issues i look at uh, problems and um, that draws me where i see a problem unfolding I take it up in research. I try to find out what is happening. I try to come up with um, solutions, what can be done. I encourage other colleagues, uh, researchers to team up with me to look into that case and um, come up with um, something that can be done. So because of that, I've actually, delved into a lot of things that uh, to say what my expertise is, is a little difficult. <laughs> All right. Uh, but you can give us some examples, no? So at least we have some to go on. Okay, I worked on the Civil War. I worked on uh, women. Nothing was done. Something was done on women actually before I embarked on women during the civil war. But that study was done east of the Niger. So I saw a big gap west of the Niger and I tried to study that and fill it up. Now, after like 10 years of um, uh, studying about women, writing about women and um, writing about men too, I went into Islam decided to find out what is going on in that area. Um, Nigeria is uh, roughly divided into two. This is a monolithic uh, north and monolithic south, but it's not really that way. So I looked at Islam in uh, the southeast and um, part of the south-south. That the only state I didn't cover in the south-south is Edo state. And um, in the next few, few months and few years, I, I will address that gap. So from that, I've also moved on to other issues. Three years ago, we started having problems around resources, a lot of debts, crisis everywhere. And um, I went in there too, to find out what exactly is happening. What can we do? How can we solve this problem with our, with, uh, with our resources? So problems actually drive where I go to. And I use history to solve those problems. Interesting. And I want to believe that uh, all these problems, all these uh, projects that you do are always in the nature of research, you knowing that you do a lot of research in that, correct? Yeah, yeah, that research. Mm -hmm. All right, now, as this, uh, they have to do with history and research, can you share anything with me, like how, is it it is to do historic research in Nigeria, considering the circumstances we have just discussed up to this point? You must be very motivated. You must be motivated. I mean, from within you. you. You should not be looking for somebody to encourage you. You should have enough dose of encouragement from within to engage in anything. Now, let me talk about um, delving into Islam. Um, I find that quite interesting because it came from my being assigned to teach Islamic revolutions in West Africa. So um, I looked at the curriculum, the way it was structured, 
we will study Islam in other parts of uh, the continent, as uh, the West African uh, sub-region especially. Then we come to Sokoto Caliphate and the course will end. And I felt that that was too abrupt. So beyond Northern Nigeria, does that mean there's no Islam elsewhere in Nigeria? I now had to self-teach myself, delved into Western Nigeria and found out that some people have actually studied Islam in Western Nigeria. I read up their works and then I looked into Eastern Nigeria where very little was done by that time. At the time I was coming to work on Islam in Eastern Nigeria, there were just about four publications already. The first one was dated um, in the 1950s. That the, the first uh, study was done in the 50s by Simon Utenberg, but published in 1971. It was followed by another study done by a Pakistani published in 1984. And um, uh, two studies done by a, a white man, Anthony Douglas, published in uh, 2000. Then um, a brief study done by the first uh, Nigerian to engage with Islam in Eastern Nigeria, but he's from uh, the West. An article he did on the um, city of... Um, when I started, people, were, people had a lot of things to say. I mean, my colleagues, wow, what are you venturing into? There are no Muslims here, there are no Muslims here. Eventually, I was able to locate a Muslim uh, within the axis of the university, behind the, around the university environs. And uh, he directed me to Enugu, where there's an Islamic center. And from there, yeah, I proceeded. So what I'm trying to say is um, research in Nigeria is not easy. It's not easy because we don't have a funding to depend upon. We have to support ourselves. So you have to do that. You also have to deal with the fact that people think you're wasting your time. You know, we, we kind of look down on anything that will make us use our money for the public good. We don't think we can invest for what does not primarily benefit us. When the issue is for general good, no, we don't um, handle it well. We, we kind of think we are plowing, we are wasting our resources. So for me, it has not been that way. Um, I have enjoyed researching in Nigeria, but I have to also depend on my own resources to do that. And then I must say that I have a very supportive husband who also supports financially and morally and even accompanies me to the field. So that's very encouraging. If it is to look at people out there, you know, to, for encouragement, no, it doesn't come that way. And that even applied when I studied um, women and civil war in the, in Anioma, the West Niger area. You know, it was too far flung a study. Again, I had to depend on my resources and uh, I had to mobilize myself mentally, emotionally, encouragement wise, everything to do it. So these are the challenges. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, now. That your research, the um, the role of women in the Nigerian Civil War, in this case, in your specific area that you concentrated on, uh, can you share anything about us? What was the key message that you wanted to pass in that in that book, in that research? Of course, the book is available on Amazon for the person that want to buy it. Yeah, but okay. What was the key message that you were concentrating on? Uh, it wasn't just one message. There were several messages coming out from that study. The first message is 
that the civil war was not fought only east of the Niger, the Igbo mainland east of the Niger, Eastern Nigeria, no. The war was equally fought west of the Niger in Delta State, the Igbo area known as Anioma, it was fought there. So we have these two major theaters of war. Much of the happenings actually took place in the East, but the West, the Anioma area was another important theater of war that could not be ignored. That's one message. The second message is that women were as much a part of the war as, as men. It was not only men that fought the war. In fact, the Anioma scenario brings it out very well. Women were in the fighting force. Women played as much part as the men. And women were very instrumental in the successes of that war. If Biafra succeeded in the war, it was because they had women backing them up. My sister, my senior sister, I will, as I will call her Professor Glory, Gloria Choko, who studied um, the role of women east of the Niger, showed how instrumental they were in supporting the war effort. I wrote a little on east of the Niger, not as much as I did west of the Niger. So I understand very well what women did. West of the Niger, women, I mean, they were superheroes. They were very, very wonderful in their support of this war. Their case was pe peculiar because when the federal army invaded that area, Delta State precisely, that is, then it was um, Midwest, from Midwest to Bendel State before it became um, Delta State. The Igbo area, when, when the federal troops invaded the Igbo area, they started by massacring the men. There was massive extermination of the men. With the men no more available, the women took charge. The women had the men to rely on, but when the men were gone, they were defenseless. They were not intimidated. They did not go into hiding. Those of them that decided to join the fighting corps moved to the East and joined the fighting corps. Those that remained, remained with one mind to help their brothers and their sisters East of the Niger to survive the war. So they organized extensively. After burying their husbands, burying their brothers, burying their male children that died, they took over the trade that sustained the war in the East. There was nothing they did not do to navigate the soldiers, the federal troops, you know, to send resources to the fighting team East of the Niger. And um, the military officers that commanded the war in different fronts, confessed indeed that their greatest challenge were the women. It was easy to deal with the men, to remove them, to kill them, but they couldn't break the spirit of the women who continued to fight a war by supporting the fighting corps, sending resources, sending food items to help cushion the harsh effects of the war east of the Niger. So that's the second message. The third message is the society was never the same again. You know, before the civil war, female education was not very popular, especially in a, that a part of Nigeria, the Midwest and the Igbo area in the Midwest. The war kind of was a big lesson to women. Women saw what happened during the war. They saw how difficult it was for them to survive. 
they observed that the few people who had life re relatively easy were those who had a measure of education. So when government was put in place uh, in, over that um, axis, that is the Western axis, those women who had trained as uh, either teachers or trained as nurses or trained as secretary school get a job in the government. Their sisters who did not go to school couldn't. Now these sisters, and they were much, much more in number who didn't go to school, they were the ones that now championed female education after the war. Many mothers said, my daughter must go to school. If this is no longer normal for only the boys to go to school, the girl also should go to school. So you could see the social change it brought about, a total cultural change. It opened a big door of education to women and it changed quite a lot of things. At least we can take these three messages as coming from that study. Thank you very much, Dr. Professor Chidu. That is really very important. Now, I'm trying to understand in your in your in the feed now, when you go out and talk to the people, uh, can you say anything about that? Like the people you meant to talk to talk with? Because okay, I interview uh, a man who was uh, in Portai Court at the time, who was in the publication. We, we basically they were there to publicate the weapons, no? And of course, uh, most of these instruments they are still available in that piano in the, the war museum there. Uh, now, let's look at the women that you talked to who were maybe directly in the war or have been supportive in the war. I want to hear what was what the kind of interaction you had with them when you contacted them for this research. Uh, the interaction, they were welcoming. Uh... They were willing to tell their stories. You know, sometimes the things you pass through, you kind of get a better perspective to it when you have the privilege of sharing it with another person. These women actually didn't think they did anything unique. To them, they were simply surviving the war. They were adjusting to the circumstances of the time. They knew that their sisters and their brothers we are in the East fighting, they knew. One of the things that uh, came out clearly in the communication is that uh, unity of the Igbo. They saw themselves as one. They were one family, one broad Igbo family. What was happening to A was happening to B. So for them, they were kind of trying to help their brothers help their sisters to survive. They didn't even think they did anything unique. It's those of us who had the privilege of studying the accounts, examining the issues that can say, wow, these people did something tremendous here. But they looked at themselves as just ordinary people, ordinary women um, trying to cope with the times, trying to make ends meet for themselves but at the same time also trying to help somebody else to survive. So that's it. Some also were not um, very willing to tell their story. The civil war wasn't a very pleasant experience, not for anybody. Uh, no, no matter where you were or where you stand in the scheme of things, it wasn't just a pleasant war at all. So there were those who would want to forget what happened, but not many of them actually, just few people that wouldn't want to talk. Others, we are willing to really say what they remembered of the war, what they did during the war, how they navigated uh, the problems, how they outsmarted uh, the soldiers and so on and so forth. Some had a <laughs> interesting, interesting laughs, you know, at some of their rescapades. But it's interesting. It also tells how courageous these women were, very courageous. When somebody will package um, her market goods in a coffin and uh, give the impression that they're going to bury somebody, but actually carrying the coffin across the border to help people at the other end. I mean, very interesting, but <laughs> very amusing. You see, this is the human story. 
I, I think it's good to tell this story. It is very, very important, no? Because this is who we are. We are people. We are not perfect. Uh, we sometimes we fight, sometimes we live, sometimes we die. But it is we will be doing a disservice to our generation, those that will come after us, if we do not tell this story. So we go back to the conversation again that it is absolutely, absolutely important that we tell our story. You see, I was interviewing a lecturer uh, in Tennessee University. Uh, then, of course, the conversation was about the role of women in Guinea Bissau. Uh, because just like there and in many other parts in Africa, of course, in, in, in a global situation, no? and the side of the women in the world is not often re recounted. No? You can talk even of the of world war, the European civil war, what to call it like that, okay? Call it world war, that's how the European would prefer it, no? <laughs> with everything that happened to them, they happen to also the other people. So, in the Nigerian civil war too, women have been there. They have been there. So when we are saying the role of women in the war, it's not like we are trying to do them a favor. Because now, think about it. You have a husband, you have a son. Maybe you, you only have these two. Now, the enemy came and he killed both of them. It is natural that you take a gun and fight. It is just natural. It's a normal, that's the normal way of human being behave. You cannot be begging. Them. What are you, you have nothing anymore. You, can, you want to kill me? Kill me. You already killed my son and killed my husband. So, what is there to live for? So, saying that the women, were also there, not just carrying goods to, or maybe carrying food to their to other men, that they were actually there fighting, is a natural thing. But we hardly hear is told. Now, the question I really am trying to pose to you is, how can more version of the women's story be told also in our day-to-day -day life? Because it is not a favor to them. They have been there. How can we hear more of this story? Yeah, it's, um, you know, we have a world that thinks that what women do don't matter. Um, but they matter a lot, just like you have um, said. What we need to do is to create this uh, sensitivity that their story is as important as the story of the men. You know, you earlier you defined history as his and story. There's also a version that says her story. So when you have the his or her, you have the story at the other end. When you come to history, we have a uh, major blocks. We have the political history, we have the social history, we have the economic history. These are the major blocks. But there are so many subdivisions of history under these blocks with different names. Women can be studied under political history or even economic history. It only takes that sensitivity in the person doing the study to bring in their story, to bring in their story. When I was a student of history in the 80s, not much was done about bringing in the female voice. So we often didn't hear the female voice. We only heard about what the men did, what the men did, what the men did. I would say that that was even what prompted me to actually um, tell the story of those whose voices we have not heard. When I did my masters, I still followed on what the men did. But thank God, coming to do my PhD, I had a rethink. I had a rethink and I decided to look for a voice, a group whose voice have not been heard. And I settled on the voice of women to tell their story. So it is just that sensitivity. In, um, over time, within, um, I would say, five years of um, teaching in the University of Nigeria, I developed a course, African Women in History. That course was to sensitize students to women, their own role in history, to make them kind of aware that history has another angle that we often do not incorporate in the 
majority, what we rarely hear about them. So we now started looking at women, African women, anywhere from North, South, East and West. What are their stories like? What are they doing? What have they done? So as we sensitize students to these varieties of, of voices, they become aware that history is not just about what the men have done. It is also what the women have done, what the young woman has done, what the older woman has done, what the young female child has done. They all make up that story. Our story is not complete when all these voices are not represented. That is the only way the story can be uh, complete because like, uh, like I also told the lecturer, uh, which of course, uh, of course, it is just the, the reality. The men and the women are the co-creator of their society. It is not just the men, it is not just the women. And this nature has set the rule very clear. If we leave only the men in this world, the, the humanity will perish. And if we leave only the women to humanity, we perish. So sure. it's, not, it's not just that we only tell one side of the story when we know that we both depend on each other for us to exist. So I think if anything we can do to promote more of that second version that made the story complete, then it has to be done. All right, I want to thank you so much, Professor Chedo. We are really be very interested in the conversation. Now, to conclude this uh, conversation this morning, what would be your final statement? Uh, whether in terms of the importance of storytelling, looking at Nigeria, or maybe a particular thing you wanted to see, I didn't make mention of, please go ahead and conclude it in your own way. Okay, what will be my final statement or comment is this. Um, it's part of um, our earlier discussion on history, removing history from the curriculum and getting history back to the curriculum. Knowledge production in Nigeria stands on its own. It is looked at as something independent of policy. We don't have a government that looks at what is going on in the research centers of our universities to kind of bring in one thing or the other to help in the running of the country. A lot of researches have been done. A lot has been said. A lot are buried in books. In other places, including where you are, Government looks at what happens in the universities, knowledge that is produced in the university, and makes use of this knowledge for bettering the welfare of the society. Our government should migrate to this very level. In Nigeria, we should begin to take our universities more seriously. We should begin to look at our universities as partners in government, partners in governance. We should begin to look at the knowledges being produced, synthesize them. How can we internalize this? How can we apply this? We must, the, we must stop the policy or the attitude of um, pushing away information, in knowledge. No, we do that a lot in the country and it has not helped us. And um, one adverse effect is lack of continuity in our policies, in what we do. So we should pay attention to knowledge that is being produced in the universities, in our research centers, in our research institutes, and utilize them in policies that we make for the welfare of the country. That's what I would say. I mean, that's the last thing I will chip in in our conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the, the, the contribution to, to this conversation. And I believe that the audience that are listening to us, they have a lot of value from me because history, everything, 
history for us is everything. If you don't know where you are coming from, you don't know where you are going to. So we must do everything we can to make sure that our version of reality is told. And we are the only one that will tell this story. Nobody's going to do it for us. Because as you can see, because uh, we have not think that it was important, I, that, was, that grew up in the state, have to learn about my state from, from outside. This is not good. That is giving too much away. Allowing somebody to tell your story for you is too much of a price to pay. So thank you very much. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Obehe podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehe Ewafo. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.